For today's Verite interview, I'm joined by a New York-based singer-songwriter, Kendra Morris, whose album Banshee came out last year, but uh, has recently been featured on the show Ray Donovan. Uh, Kendra, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, no problem. Thanks for having me. And uh, congratulations on the show. Uh, you wouldn't know that the record came out last year, uh, given that on all the YouTube pages of your videos, there seems to be so many people uh, discovering you now because of that show, myself included. Yeah, it's been crazy. It's uh, it's so funny because there's one, um, somebody had posted like a, an album, the album cover on their YouTube a while back with that song playing and that's the one that people have all went to first and it's like, it's shot up in views and it's been kind of crazy. All the comments, Ray Donovan, Ray Donovan sent me. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. <laughs> And, uh, of course, the finale for Ray Donovan is uh, is this coming week, I, I believe, in the States. Are you a fan of the show? Like, how you did know, you get involved? I haven't seen it yet, and I wanted to go and watch the episode. My song's on, but I want to watch the whole series, and I don't I don't have a TV. So I'm going to have to wait until I can watch it on the Internet, and then I'm going to watch all the episodes and get hooked on it the way I usually do. But So I haven't even... I saw like a clip somebody sent me from their phone of them recording like my song in the scene, but aside from that, I haven't seen any of it. You're not in a rush to see your bit. You'll just see it naturally as as you yeah. get into the show. Because I want to understand it like in in its scene, and I want to understand. And I keep hearing that the show is great. So. Oh, it is. It is for sure. For sure. Oh, I was just gonna say something funny. Uh, my bass player was at the post office and he saw Lee Schreiber walk in right after he left and he texted me. He's like, I just saw Lee Schreiber walk into the post office. I was like, go back and introduce yourself. You should have. Tell him that. Tell him we're in his show. Well, of, of course, there is the potential that uh, it seems to have been such a popular episode that uh, you have your covers record out now, uh, Mockingbird, more recently. And um, so maybe there's potential in the second series to uh, use some of your stuff again. And maybe yeah. you, you yourself, you can meet Leave finally. Yeah, or I'll go find him at the post office. Yeah, it seems to be the way to do it. So uh, we're here today. Um, you know, you are the first in a, a new column we're starting. We're talking to artists about uh, the movies they were watching growing up how that influenced them and how maybe even that had a little impact on their art uh, years later. So I, I, I really wanted to start with, you know, the fact that you are a musician. What's your first memory of seeing something where the moving image and music was so perfectly married that it just blew your mind? You know, I was thinking about this and I'm sure I have a lot of examples, but I one of those memories where like sometimes it just takes something to to uh to spawn the memory but one song that it just kind of came to me right now there was the made for tv movie of stephen king's the stand that came out in like probably the early 90s or late 80s here and i remember watching it on tv and i remember there's like in the beginning when everybody dies of the of uh the uh this uh, chemical explode, this chemical leak that kills off the entire, pretty much the entire world. Um, and while they're cleaning up the bo the bodies, this amazing song played. And I remember I was like, "What is that song?" I look, I, I it was before the before you could just look for anything on the internet, so it haunted me for a while. But later, uh, it was uh, it was Crowded House. Um, it was Crowded House, uh, Don't Dream, Don't Dream It's Over. The song that goes, hey now, hey now, don't dream. And I was just like, that song, I just remember thinking, like, when I think of, like, that song during that scene was so powerful. It was so, it was just such, like, a dark, like, eerie scene, and that song was so good. And then, like, there's Molly Ringwald, like, it, or it's like even I, it, there she is like planting the flowers when it all kind of is starting and I'm, I just I just remember that song so that's that's one kind of off the one kind of random example and then um, 
I, I can't think of any really, really strong specifics, but I know something that I've really been into lately is when I go, I've started um, record, I've started uh, buying up a lot of records. That's like my, uh, my, my buyer's therapy, I guess. I like to go to, there's a couple record stores by my house, but the first section I was looking is the soundtrack section. Um, because you just never know, like, the amazing stuff that you're going to find and all the different artists. And, like, lately I've been into Les, Les Baxter, who did a lot of different movies in the 60s and 70s. He did, um, he did, uh, I got this soundtrack called Hell's Bells to a biker movie that he did, and it's so good. I've just been kind of going through all these different uh, soundtracks lately. So... You're coming to soundtracks as someone uh, perusing the the shelves and the rackets, not necessarily watching the films, and then going out and and buying the soundtrack after seeing the movie. Yeah, I do it backwards sometimes. There's actually a film that I went and downloaded the soundtrack to The Source, The Family. I saw I saw a trailer for it on an airplane. It's about um, this cult in the 70s in Los Angeles, and I guess they've all moved over to Hawaii now. They disbanded. But I remember seeing the trailer and being struck about how good the music was. So I saw it at my favorite record store, Kim's Video. They put up all of their like weekly picks of records, and that was up there. But it was like $40, and I was like, I can't, I can't spend that kind of money right now. So I ended up going home and finding it and buying it online. But uh, it's awesome. It's all the music was like this uh, cult. The whole soundtrack is the music that the cult made. Like they were a band. And it's been awesome. Like I've been listening to it on repeat. I'm just like, it's kind of like, it's got a lot of like tinges of gospel and uh, folk. And the, like these voices are amazing. So now I'm dying to see the movie. But it's going to be weird going backwards and seeing it because I'm going to know all the music. And it's going to be interesting to see how it's placed because it's a documentary. So a lot of times the documentaries, documentaries have some of the best music because they're telling this story and have to rehash a story and like build something. Not always so much like they got to make it. Sometimes you, you got to be careful with the documentary. It's so easy to be boring. So really, and I, really I also think that we're so much more aware when we watch documentaries about a degree of emotional manipulation Mm -hmm. that we're not necessarily thinking about with the narrative features. So, you know, maybe our ears kind of are are more attuned to the music in a doc uh, because of that reason. Yeah. So what was the, uh, what was your favorite childhood movie growing up and have you seen it recently and, and does it still stand up for you? Well, there's a couple, but the two that I was thinking about um, first one being Goonies, because I was like, I always dreamed of like finding a pirate ship and finding all this money and going on this adventure and having a friend named Sloth. And that was by far like one of my favorites as a kid, because that's like, for me as a kid, that was the dream growing up was to just be swept away on like a crazy adventure. And me and my brothers would have all these clubs, we would build tree houses and like, just growing up, I didn't have a lot of, uh, I didn't, there weren't a lot of, I didn't stay in and watch a lot of TV as a kid. It was always like my parents, like it was always, uh, I'm playing squeaky with my dog. I'm sorry. It was always, um, it was always like what sort of outdoors adventure could we find? And so I remember watching Goonies and that was just like, that was the thing that like I wanted in life. I was like, I need, I need this. And then, the other movie that I loved growing up, and actually I have watched it on and off throughout my life, it's still a favorite, is the movie Troll. Um, it's a classic. It's That was another one that, like, I remember wanting to have that life. It's this kind of weird, like, enchanting, it was kind of a horror movie. And I, it's funny because my parents left us alone when we were younger, and my older brother and I would watch 
we got into horror movies, and we'd force our little brother to watch them. And he would try to hide under the blanket, and we wouldn't let him. Remember us being, like, seven years old watching Hello, Mary Lou, Prom Night 2, like, all these horror movies. And to this day, my little brother hates horror, and I love it. You've picked Troll, and uh, everyone now looking back, they, they always tend to talk about Troll 2. Yeah! Uh, like it's a thing that people like ironically now i suppose and you know they have a lot of midnight screenings like here in london they had one uh, of troll 2 recently at the prince charles but they never screened the original so it's fascinating to uh hear you go for that one uh, and not plum for troll 2 which seems to be the more popular well troll 2 i appreciate in a whole other way like it's funny because troll 2 doesn't even have anything to do with troll 1 it was just like it was kind of like um have you ever seen Russ Meyer's Beyond the Valley of the Dolls? You know, I have that on a DVD, and it's sat there for so long, so you've, you've outed me. It's, it's, it's there, and I still need to see it. I've had it for about two years now. You got to see it. Shelf, so. It's incredible. Like, that movie, that's another one with, like, amazing soundtrack. Strawberry Alarm Clock did most of the soundtrack. And, like, that movie is another one. It has nothing to do with Valley of the Dolls. It's just Russ Meyer was like, let's do Beyond the Belt. It's actually about a girl band that moves to L.A. and they get caught up in sex and drugs and rock and roll. And then it's Russ Meyer, so it's just mostly, like, boobs and sex and people getting their heads cut off. And it's a cl- you got to see it. It's, it's, uh, it's unbelievable to me that I still haven't seen it because it's even got a Roger Ebert commentary track. Mm-hmm. You know, because he wrote that too. So, yeah, you've you know named and shamed here. So uh, I will, you know, now, now I put it out there for all our viewers. I'll, I'll make sure that I, I, I see it in the next few weeks after Rain Dance is done, and ma- maybe I'll have to write about it now. I think for the you side, got but let me know after you. I'm curious to hear about what you think after. Oh, I watched, absolutely. I remember when I got it, I felt I was so enamored with it. I watched it on repeat, like. I made all my friends come over. I'm like, you have to see this. And I watched it. I watched it probably eight times and scratched it up. And I don't own a copy anymore. So I need to. Uh... But yeah, we went from Troll to Troll 2 to Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. Well, you see, everything that you've named other than Goonies, the other ones that you picked, um, a lot of people I know, like I said, they like them ironically. But listening to your record, which has a lot of retro stylings, and just mm-hmm. hearing you talk now, like, this is a genuine love for those films. Oh, right? yeah. Totally. I mean, with the album, I did that. I have a collaborator that I work with, this guy, Jeremy Page. And him and I both kind of, we locked out with finding each other because we both share so many of the same influences. So many of, like, these, uh, we both are very, we both work visually. Like, between, like, the way that I arrange vocals and the way I hear things and the way he arranges the instruments, we both, um, it's, I don't know how to, ex- I guess the best way to explain it is, yeah, we both like work with visual moods. Like, well, I'm actually, after talking to you, I'm going to go over to the studio we're writing a bunch of new stuff, but we'll sit there and whether, you know, he's starting off on the idea or I'm starting off on the idea, you will hear a mood or, you know, sometimes he'll start with something that just has like a feel to it. And then I go somewhere in my head and it reminds me of something, whether it's like, remember there's an older song of mine and it's, you can find it on the internet. It's called Seaside. And it came out on, um, before I signed with Wax Poetics, it was on an EP we put out. And when we started writing it together, he had started to build a track and then I went over to the park, the dog park and started like, we'd listen to it over and over to hear it. And it had these dark tones. And I had just recently finished watching Carnival of Souls. And all of a sudden, like, while I'm listening to it, I just started thinking of those scenes in Carnival of Souls where there's like, uh, the, the, the carousel going around and you see those, like those images and like the organ and, um, and see, that song Seaside was completely influenced by Carnival of Souls. Wow. So even though, like, lyrically it doesn't, it, it goes there in some ways. And, but I, like, I remember being, like, thinking of, like, that, like, that, that black and white, like, the beach and the 
just like that movie, like there's so many cold tones in that movie. And just, uh, I don't know. I, I find like when I write, like there's other songs, there's songs on Banshee um, where I'm like the song, If You Didn't Go, I was visually in my head again with that one. And that whole song was written with like, like, like I had the color yellow in my head and all these like warm tones and these sounds. And when Jeremy and I work together, like, like I said, like he'll start the idea and then I start arranging and coming up and then he hears where I'm going or I'll talk about where I'm going. And then we are pretty much schooled and one, one of us is always outdoing the other, whether it's in, um, some sort of new record we found or some sort of new movie one of us or old maybe one of us has seen so we're always kind of playing the game like well did you check this out or you know and i'll explain where i'm coming from or he'll say where he's coming from and then we're just both and, and then we go back and forth and we'll do that with a song back and forth and back and forth until the song is done so, so it's interesting that you purposely let all those influences in i know you know some artists they'll have a filter where they just switch that off i just uh, i can't yeah i try to whenever i like whenever i watch a movie i feel like i'm like i try to just imagine myself as, as a i feel like whether it's a movie or day-to-day -day life like i try to remember you know even when i'm taking a break from writing i have to remember that like as an artist as a musician as some as a writer we're kind of sometimes you're a courier of whatever the like of life experiences and not everybody has the gift of being able to write a song or a melody and so as being able to do that i feel like it's your you're kind of creating a language that everybody understands and that language when you put that out there that's it's like a gift it's for other people and it's not yours anymore. You're, you're taking it and you're, you know, letting go of it. But whenever like just through my life experiences or the movies that I watch or just, or the art that I see, I try to just always be open, open to, I try to say yes to everything. I try to say yes to watching things. I'm always constantly like I go, my therapy on the weekends when I have time is I go to flea markets and thrift stores and like I go by myself a lot and I just like wander around for hours. Sometimes I don't buy anything. A lot of times I don't buy anything. A lot of times I buy a ton of junk, you know, and fill my apartment. But there's so many, there's so many um, inspiration. There's so much inspiration. Like I found actually when I was, there's just so much inspiration that could become a song or could become, you know, there, I love going through the old photos, the old records. I found Disney's Haunted Sounds record the other day, and I bought it. And my friends how, came over. How much Let's, did you buy it for? Uh, I think like $2. Oh, brilliant. Bargain. Maybe 5 But no, I like that's, to, that, that's still a good deal. Yeah. I, it's funny. Like Some friends came over, and I just played. Like, I was like, let's listen to The Howling Wind. <laughs> What was, that, what was what was their reaction? Were they into it? They were laughing. They were into it. Oh, they oh good, good. So they were laughing with you, not at you. Yeah, I was like, next date I bring over, I'm just gonna play this record. That's great. Well, you were you were talking about the the black and white in Carnival of Souls, and also mm -hmm. the fact that you were you had a pretty free range childhood in terms of movies. But uh, I'm wondering if your parents at any point you know, kind of did step in and say, look, you got to watch this. And, uh, you know, they showed you like a classic of their period or maybe when they were growing up that really s stuck with you as well and really kind I've, of opened your mind to a whole wider world of cinema. I try to think about that. And, you know, I can't, like, mostly with my parents, it was music that they were like, you got to listen to this. Movie-wise, like... I can't, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that I remember my mom was like, you should watch mystic pizza. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was thinking maybe more like it's a wonderful life or something with Jimmy Stewart, you know, my dad has kept insisting and I haven't watched it yet. Um, watching HUD haven't seen it. And he has been telling me forever to watch it. 
So that's one that I haven't done. I always, like, growing up was, like, I don't, like, parents aren't cool. You can't listen to what parents are listening to. Or And even though, like, I ended up, like, taking a bunch of their records and that's what really got me started on soul music, like, I was super secretive about it at first. Or, you know, they would take take us to, like, bluegrass festivals and take us to go see cool bands, but pretended I didn't like it, you know. But, yeah, my dad was always like, go to see HUD and Mystic Pizza. I did watch yeah. that. Well, maybe you could uh, double bill the two of them for a, a family Christmas or something. Yeah. They I might enjoy that. That's a good combination. <laughs> did you, um, so did you have a favorite movie theater growing up? There is, um. you were from Florida, right? Originally. Yeah. Yeah, from uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. And we had a dollar theater that that was kind of like when there, when, when there wasn't anything to do. The dollar theater always was playing like movies that had been out for a while. So I remember, which I'll talk about, like I remember like one of my favorite movies as an adolescent was What's Eating Gilbert Grape. Like that started a lot of things for me, but I remember when it went to the dollar theater, I would go there like three times a weekend and watch Gilbert Grape, What's Eating Gilbert Grape, over and over and over again. I also had an unhealthy obsession with Leonardo DiCaprio. Oh, I was going to ask you whether it was Leo or Johnny Depp, but you're, you're a Leo fan. I was a fan. I had a, I had a manila folder where I took any like magazine article or photo I could find on him, and I cut it out and I put it in the and then I like carried it around with me and like I had decided I'd done all this research on him and I read that he hung out in pool halls in Los Angeles and so I was like I was like 13 and I was like I have to run away to Los Angeles to hang out in these pool halls and meet Leonardo DiCaprio so he can fall in love with me it didn't work out I never made it what do you think of him in uh, Gatsby by the way. You know, I didn't go see it. Do you know why? Well, I I, I walked out of Moulin Rouge. Um, I don't blame you, to be honest. It I, gave me a headache. I, I never walked out of a movie before, but when I went and saw Moulin Rouge, I walked out of it. It was such an awful experience. Like, I can't stand Nicole Kidman also. I don't know what, what it, like, the only movie I've ever liked her in was To Die For. Oh, she's great in that. The, but she's such, like, a hateable character in that I worked out for because <laughs> I just don't like her. But that wasn't even why I didn't like Moulin Rouge. I didn't like the music. I didn't like Ewan McGregor. I, I walked out of that. So I didn't go see Gatsby just for the, like, I think I was so scarred for Moulin Rouge <laughs> that I haven't gotten to see it yet. Also, I was kind of bummed about some of the artists on the soundtrack. It just wasn't like, I don't know. I felt like it was like a soundtrack that was all just catered to like the hippest like yeah. hype. I don't know. I I loved Romeo and Juliet. I loved that soundtrack. I mean, what's really frustrating about that actually is the score for that movie by uh, Craig Armstrong, which is out on iTunes, but it didn't get an album release. I don't think you can buy it in the stores like you can the the, the, the soundtrack. Um, you know, that's got some great music on there. And um, so it's funny to hear you talking about buying scores rather than soundtracks and source music on records because increasingly now all these uh, film scores are going straight to digital because it's becoming more and more of a niche market and that's the only place that you can get it. But of course with that, there's kind of uh, less exposure for a lot of people, and it's not exactly a, a hugely popular field to begin with. So I'd mm -hmm. say if you ever if you ever do see it, just just to see Leo, you can kind of shut your ears off to the the soundtrack, which I agree. Uh, not only am I not a fan of it, but it's just kind of intrusive, I think, in a lot of ways. But uh, the, the score is really great. Okay, I will keep that in mind. So I was going to ask you the first film you walked out of. You've answered that question. But um, what, what about a film that you walked out of having to passionately defend? Or maybe maybe, uh, maybe like a 
a guilty pleasure perhaps which is not necessarily the same thing but still it's a film that you know you're constantly having to kind of justify well probably my guilty a guilty pleasure movie that i remember going to see was britney spears crossroads (laughs) well (laughs) yeah this i want to hear (laughs) i remember going to see that with like my group of friends and I mean it was awful but it was inter- like I have a secret love for I love like I think it's just because of maybe it's because of the path I've chosen and the career I've chosen but I love those movies of like making it at, or mm-hmm. like people trying to make it and basically Britney Spears plays herself and like it same old but i just remember going and being completely entertained by it because going on a road trip gonna go to la and become a star and it doesn't really happen that way for 99.99999 percent of you know take but it, it was just so it, it was entertaining and the script is just so mindless you just go in and I enjoy a, a simple, awful movie sometimes just for the fact of kind of like, I guess, just giving my brain a rest. Another movie, uh, one on the better side of like those kind of like trying to make, the, I, I've just always been into those. Um, Lady Sings the Blues or A Star, the first uh, A Star is Born. Like two, both those are great movies. I've always just been drawn to those movies. I guess just because being... You know, like, when you're going for something, like, everybody, like, finds their where they're headed to on their own. I think the journey is always the most exciting part. So when you get to see it on film or, you know, I'm just drawn to that. And, well, I, I, I just love that you're embarrassed about Crossroads, but, you know, Troll, it's like, yeah, Troll, it's great. <laughs> Oh. There's no hesitation when it comes to Troll whatsoever, so we'll we'll let you off the hook, I think. I met some of the cast of Troll too. They oh, were really? doing they were doing a doc there's a doc when they were filming their documentary, yeah. the bar that uh I, the bar that I've always worked at down the street, they all my buddy was helping with the score, um, and he got them all to come to the bar I was working at that night and I made them shots we we made the, we invented shots called no bog it basically was oh, this cool. like it's like baileys and jameson and vanilla vodka and creme de menthe and you shake it up and so we got them all to come to the bar and i gave like the son and dad no bog shots and... so yeah not only do you like troll but you got trashed with the the car yeah. that's very cool very yes. cool um, well, what about a film that always reminds you of um, the people you saw it with? Or another way maybe of putting the question is, you go and see a film with a friend or a loved one and you walk out of that film and you feel like you're closer together than you were when you walked in. Hmm. Well, I know in the high school taking my dates to the movies, that feeling closer pretty much any movie because really going to the movies with a date meant might get to hold hands mm. so what, what what's one that springs to mind G- good or bad or, or both if you're feeling brave um, well i mean i know i've kind of veered like turned this question into a whole other question but i remember in high school skipping school and taking the bus with these with anthony simonetti and aaron i forgot his last name and my friend rachel and they hid pot in a VHS cassette tape. So they're like rolling joints. And I remember we get to the movie and we went and we snuck into, um, what was that? Hackers. Hackers oh, was fun. Yes. And we snuck into Hackers and we watched Hackers. And her and I are both with these older guys that gave us the time of day, which normally no guys gave me the time of day. And I remember watching and then, like, leaving the movie, and, like, that movie was so good. I remember loving that movie then and being like, wow, that, like, who's this, who's this Angelina? It was even before I knew what her name was. Like, 
like it was just one of those like that person is a star like oh yeah it was it was the it was the same for me that was the first time that i saw her in anything and I, i went actually um opening weekend to that at a friend's uh birthday and uh yeah you're right i mean if you were in that right catchment age which i think we were i mean i would have been uh i I was 12 okay came out you know that that was pretty mind-blowing like the cgi at the time and the graphics and you know the internet was still a you know big thing i I don't think i even had internet until two years later so it kind of blew my mind yeah yeah that's great just being like and that's a great soundtrack yeah i remember buying the soundtrack and like that's one I listened to over and over and over again. Like, was it, was Thievery Corporation on it, I feel like, or? Yeah. Oh, I, I want to go re-listen to that soundtrack. Well, I, I, I just feel like the 90s, in terms of alternative culture, you know, it had so many great soundtracks. Um, like, have you ever seen any Greg Araki movies? Yes, He's, he's the guy in the Doom Generation and Nowhere and... You know, like huge formative experiences for me. And, you know, you're so right because Gatsby is such a safe, obvious top 40. I I just, you you don't see a lot of that in indie movies. And actually indie movies is even worse than the mainstream stuff because it's all a load of coffee shop, you know, acoustic strumming. And they all sound like, they all sound the same. And they all sound, you know, really depressed, but with nothing to say. Yeah, my dad's been begging me to see once the Irish, like, and apparently it's a great film. It's gotten all these awards. And I remember trying to watch it, and I just wasn't attracted to the music. It just was like that. It was, like, good songs. I just didn't, it didn't capture me, and I just remember I couldn't finish it. Like, sorry, Dad. Can I, I brought, I decided since we were talking about movies, I'm so glad I saved all this, but... I have in this old photo album, these are the movies that I went to, and what's really funny is for some of them it'll say the movie, the ticket stub, but then on it I wrote what I really went to go see and who I went with. Because I, you know, like when you're growing up, you buy like, you the key, what we would do is we buy a PG movie ticket or PG 13 and we go and sneak into the R when no one's looking. Oh, this is amazing. Okay, so surprise me. PG to R. Okay. Give me some good ones. There's definitely some Titanics in here, but I actually went and saw it. How many um, times did you see Titanic? I, at least, I think I saw it three times. I don't have all the tickets on here. Okay, so here is, okay, in and out on Friday... October 3rd, 1997. That was with Kevin, what's his face? Uh, Klein. It's actually excellent. Yeah. Well, I didn't go see it. <laughs> the ticket was $3.75. In New York now, we pay $13 to go to the movies. So that's like I up know, it's... 3% since 1997. What I really want to go see with Kelly, Ryan, Keith, and Eric was U-Turn. Oh, well, they, you can't go... Th- those two are both great. Oh, U-Turn is really underrated, yeah. I think. It was one great role. I will... I remember that was when I was like, go j That was before she was J-Lo, and she was just Jennifer Lopez. And I was like, yeah, this woman is awesome. And then she did Jiglia, and I fell asleep <laughs> during that. But she did do... She did do Out of Sight. I didn't see that. Oh, that, that's so funny because I'd been planning to bring that film up the entire interview because when I listened to your record, you know, I I'd, I'd said to you uh, in an email before we did this that that your record made me think there are a couple of songs on there that could just sit on the Jackie Brown soundtrack. Mm-hmm. And if you didn't know that you'd released them last year, a lot of people would probably go, oh, yeah, you know, that's an old cut from 73 or whatever. The other soundtrack is uh, out of sight instrumentally you, your record i was convinced that you had that album on repeat and you've never seen the movie which is I've never seen it All right, now well that, yeah bump that up to the top of netflix okay oh, not least because netflix- jennifer lopez is fantastic in that film like it's it's renowned as being a great role by everybody i'm trying to think yeah i don't think i've ever seen it 
I'm not even. It's not even. Yeah, it's her and her and George Clooney. Steven Soderbergh directed it. Wow! All right, I'll watch that. So far, we're doing really well because you snuck out of a, a, a or you didn't go and see a movie that's really good, and you snuck into a really good underrated Oliver Stone film. So yeah, I was. I must have been like sixteen. Sixteen and seeing like Sean Penn's teeth fall out of his face and okay, here's one. Seven years in Tibet on November first, nineteen ninety seven. I actually have never seen Seven Years in Tibet. Yeah, it's, um, it's not very good. The ticket for that was five seventy five, but really I went and saw Kiss the Girls. I can deal with a deep like kind of bad thriller as long as it's entertaining. Like I remember being really entertained when I watched it, like I don't know. I love serial killer movies too. Like I'm reading a book about H. H. Holmes right now, and the the construction of the World's Fair and kind of the melding of the two worlds. And I just find that stuff kind of dark and interesting. And back to Greg Araki, like I remember the first Greg Araki film I saw was Doom Generation, and I was like hooked on him after that. I remember going to the video store and like looking up what was what, i can't even remember was it one called nowhere yeah yeah that's yeah my favorite trying to find, find any greg Araki film and then did you see mysterious skin oh yeah it's it's fantastic totally different very mature it, for him but oh yeah he's definitely like you can still like there's still the tones of him but that was definitely like a mature like he had really good act like because normally he like, I feel like he purposely had like bad acting in his films. Like it was like teenage soap opera acting, and I, that's what I loved about it. Maybe let's think about for the last question here, um, a film that you saw, you know, in your teenage years, formative years, or whatever, and uh, you didn't like it, or maybe you hated it. And now that you're a little older, and you saw it a few years down the line, you now love it. Hmm. Because your experience growing up has changed the way that you, you know, look at the film. For me, I've always had listed lists of movies that I should go see, and I put them off for whatever reason. And you know, people are like, "Watch this," and I have to be in the mood to watch them. Like, I have to be in a mood. I'm always, I have to watch whatever I'm in the mood for. But one movie that maybe I wouldn't, as a kid, if I think back, like I wouldn't have. I appreciated so much as I do now was like I recently for the first time saw Harold and Maude which was incredible like I was sick and I was like what should I watch and I was like oh Harold and Maude like I've never seen this and I've heard about it for years and I watched it and I like cried like a baby in bed and I was like this is the most amazing thing and you know had I watched that when I was like 12 or 13 I don't know if I would have had the appreciation that I have for it now of just there's so much like subtle like the humor in it is so subtle and kind of a little dark and just uh like that's one that i imagine you know if as that question kind of flips like had i seen it then so what about um say when you were younger and you were you were in the cinema and maybe the first time you felt like you were watching your own life projected on the screen a film that you really identified with on a deeply personal level i watched it on vhs but i so much identified with it and to this day it's one of my favorite films is uh welcome to the dollhouse oh yes todd salons i love his films and i remember there was this video store that i used to go to and it was always i was like what is this like that's like I, that's the same way I buy records. That's the same way I do. I find something that just like reaches out to me, and then I take a chance on it. And that was a movie I took a chance on. I saw, you know, like Don Wieners like laying on like an illustration of a dollhouse or something. Took it home and like was blown away. I remember I was like 14 watching it or something, but I related to her so much because like me, I was uh, picked on a lot growing. I was like super like just awkward kid not just for one year not for two but for many years like just everything like uh about me was awkward not just physically like I was my friends called me queen of the dorks because I was uh, 
just like um just a goofy dorky kid and I always felt kind of like this like thumbtack in like a room full of you know males or something just kind of and when I saw that movie I related so much and thought it was so funny and then I showed all my friends and they're like this is depressing I'm like no this is hilarious this is amazing and I watched it like over and over and to this day like when I find out that a friend hasn't seen it I'm like we're watching this right now. And then we're watching all of his other movies. I love that movie. That was probably the first movie that... That movie I related to and Muriel's Wedding was another one that I kept going back to see at the Dollar Theater. I was wondering if you happened to see Kids when it was released. Oh, because yeah. It was, it was banned here in the UK. So, we, you know, even if we wanted to sneak in, we couldn't see it. I didn't see it in the theaters, but we somehow... Where I, will, I rented it somehow, like, with my parents' card, and no one knew that I, or I told my parents it was something else, I'm like, don't, and I, like, hid the rating from them, and I remember me and my friends hiding out in my bedroom, I had a TV in my room, and I remember us, like, locking the doors and, like, lying to my parents with what we were doing and what we were watching, and, like, watching kids, and being, like, oh, I remember there was, like, that teenage, like, the sex scene in the beginning. That was the first time I had seen, like, I was just, like, whoa, like, any movie like that. And I just, you know, like, I grew up, uh, I, I was, you know, not a sheltered home, because we did watch a lot of horror, but my parents kept an eye on what we watched, you know, for the most part, like, with that kind of stuff. Although, horror stuff I got away with, like, or stuff when they were home, we'd watch it, but... I don't know. That was the first kind of movie I'd seen like that. Um, I don't know if you knew this, talking about trailers, but did you know I had a song in a movie trailer this last uh, December? Which film was it? Dead Man Down with Colin oh, Farrell. Oh, yes. You had your cover of Shine On You Crazy Diamond. So when you, like, I was just thinking of movie experiences when we were talking about things, and my dad and I... We knew the day that it was going to, the trailer, the first day the trailer was going to come out in the theaters. So my dad, which on Christmas, we always go to the movies. Whether, it, lately it's just been me and my dad. Like, my mom's always tired. Or, you know, my little brother has kids now. Um, so lately it's just, the past couple years, it's just been me and my dad going to the movies. But we knew that Dead Man Down was going to play, the trailer was going to play before Django Unchained on Christmas Day. So we went to the theaters, which funny enough is we went to where the Dollar Theater used to be. They tore it down and turned it into a giant mega, like, fancy theater now. But it was going back to that same location. And we went to see Django Unchained. And I remember, like, reading through the trailers. And there was a chance it wasn't going to play because of the Newtown Massacre. They had pulled all violent trailers from most theaters along the East Coast. But Florida isn't... is. Florida is its own, like, you know, that's more of Southeast. So it was like a gamble if it was going to be there or not. And all these trailers, if it goes through, I'm like, is this going to be it? Is this going to be it? And then we get to the last trailer before the movie, and there it is. And it was just, that's going to be, like, probably the movie theater experience that sticks in my head for life because it was just, like, they had the giant sound system, and there, me and my dad are sitting there and hearing this whole song that, that I had done and play through the trailer and it was the craziest feeling like like I had hairs on the back of my neck and like I so bad wanted to stand up and be like this is me you know I'm in my hometown at the movies and I wanted to be like that's me you're hearing but I didn't we just like high five like we just kind of sat next to each other and high five each other we like, it's cool you know that's got to be the best Christmas present you've ever had. It was amazing. It was, it was an incredible, like, you know, and you only get one time for that. Like, I hope it happens again, but it won't be my first time. Like, that was my first time. Oh, it's such a beautiful story and such a perfect place uh, to end this. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thanks. Really appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks so much.